How to tell when someone just straight up copied your stuff. Well, it's pretty easy. When they copy your mistakes. Hey everyone, this is John from EastCoastArmory.com and I'm here today with a model showcase video for this 135th scale M247 Sergeant York Divad. The model in this video here is built for my own personal collection and is not for sale and or purchase. However, like I often mention in these build videos, I frequently take on commission build projects from models ranging between 135th scale and 16th scale. For availability and pricing information, that information would be best by contacting me through the email address listed below, which is info at eastcoastarmory.com. To the casual observer, this model may look like it's built predominantly out of the box. However, looks are definitely misleading because this model has underwent a few extra modifications that definitely departed from the standard kit offering. In this video, we're going to be going over all of these modifications, as well as going over some certain areas of the kit to watch out for, and giving this model a thorough in-box review. So stay tuned because there's going to be a bunch of info coming right at you. To start this video off, let's go ahead and take a quick walk around this model. And this vehicle here is one of my personal favorite vehicles, which may surprise some people, and it's one of my favorite failures, the M247 Sergeant York Divad. This vehicle here was developed in the 1970s where the U.S. Army was looking to update and modernize their anti-air defense system, specifically in regards to a vehicle to protect their ground forces from enemy air attack. This is much along similar lines of what the Soviets were doing with the Schlicke, as well as what the Bundeswehr was doing with the Gepard. Prior to the development of this vehicle over here, the only other vehicle that did a similar task was the M163 Vulcan. This was an M113 with a 20mm Vulcan cannon mounted on the roof of the vehicle. Although this vehicle was very successful and served with the US military for a very long time, it was deemed that it wasn't going to be adequate with dealing with the new Soviet threats, being the Hind helicopter, the Frogfoot, or also with this type of vehicle potentially not being able to keep up with the new generation of main battle tanks and infantry fighting vehicles that were being developed by the US military at the same time. And of course, specifically speaking with this time frame, we're looking at the end of the MBT-70 era, and we're looking into the onset of the new vehicles from the 80s, like the M1 Abrams, as well as also the Bradley. The concept of having a dedicated vehicle for protecting an armored division was something that received a brand new anacronym, as the US military loves to do, known as the DIVAD, which stood for Division Air Defense. As a side note, it's also David written in reverse, because apparently the guy that coined that term had a son named David, or at least that's how the story goes. And the idea was actually a pretty sound one. The idea was to have basically something similar to, again, what the West Germans did with the Gepard, where you take a standard main battle tank chassis and you mount a dedicated air defense type weapon system on board. This way you get the best of both worlds. You get some decent armor protection and you have a vehicle that will keep up with the standard main battle tanks that were being used at the time by said military. The Germans, or I should say the West Germans specifically, did this with the Gepard where they use the Leopard 1 chassis. However, for the U.S. Army, they were going to relegate this role to the M48A5. At this time, the M48 was definitely becoming long in the tooth, and the M48A5 was really the last gasp of relevance for this vehicle to keep it in, at this point, more or less secondary line service. So there were a large number of these vehicles that were in the U.S. inventory, so since the vehicle was going to not necessarily be that great as a tank, it was definitely going to be a nice suitable candidate for the use of a air defense system. Keep in mind, at this time, the M48A5 utilized the same power pack as the M60A1, so ergo, it theoretically was going to be able to keep up with the tanks that were intended for this vehicle to protect, but do so without sacrificing a hull for, or I should say, a hull from an M60. As you can see, the concept of using as many off-the-shelf components as possible in order to save some money and also cut some corners was something that was going to be another hallmark of this program. In addition of utilizing the M48A5 chassis, they were going to utilize the main armament, which was a standard 40 millimeter Bofors, which have been in the U.S. military inventory now since World War II. And for the electronics, they were going to utilize the radar from the F-16. Again, all these units were more than proven and were just sitting 
off the shelf. So trying to adapt them into an armored vehicle was something that was going to take less time, theoretically, and also theoretically, do it for a much lower budget compared to just starting from the ground up and designing something fresh. And unfortunately, although all of these ideas sound awesome on paper, in practice, this is where things started to fall apart. Before we get too far up the road, however, when this program was announced, there were three prototypes that were proposed. One of which, and it's also one of the coolest ones, is a brand new turret that utilized the main armament from the A-10 Warthog, which already sounds insanely awesome. And sadly, there's this project never evolved past a model form, which, again, is kind of cool in its own right, but... Unfortunately, you know, this never came to be, but the other two serious competitors was from General Dynamics and also the other variant was from Ford Aerospace. Both systems were going to take an M48A5 hull, modify it in order to fit in the extra equipment required to power all of the electronics and other systems, and develop a brand new turret with the new armament in it. The General Dynamics system also utilized lots of off-the-shelf components, but they were utilizing basically the equipment from the Gepard. Again, logical choice, the Gepard was a proven system, the auto cannons were great, as was the electronics package. The Ford version utilized the components I mentioned before, which utilized the radar system from the F-16, and also the Bofors that I previously referenced earlier as well. The two went head to head, and this is where this story gets very, very interesting. Apparently, the General Dynamics vehicle actually performed better and outperformed the Ford Aerospace version. However, the Ford one won the the contract. There's some speculation here to perhaps this was done due to corruption where the Ford executives and the military brass kind of had a little uh, friendship with one another and, you know, uh, one person scratches the other person's back type deal. However, at the end of the day, the General Dynamics version lost the contract and the Ford Aerospace Vehicle 1. Ford Aerospace got the contract and the vehicle was then adopted as the M. 247 and it was designated Sergeant York after the World War I American hero. The program was originally accepted in 1977 and about 50 units were produced in total. And it was shortly after the units were produced and were fielded, it was when everything started to fall apart. <laughs> The vehicle had a lot of problems with it. Not so much automotively speaking, that was basically figured out. However, the problem was with the other things that were taken off the shelf. Starting with the radar, the F-16 radar is an excellent radar. The problem is it's designed for use in a fighter plane, and fighter planes are up in the sky, and they are not inhibited by things like power lines, birds, trees, you know, anything along those lines, even children's balloons. And because of that, the radar works fantastic. Unfortunately, for ground use, all of those mentioned obstacles were causing problems with the radar system, and the guidance system was practically blind as a bat. The other problem that the Sergeant York was having was with the armament. Even though the 40mm Bofors was an excellent system, the units that were in the US inventory were aging quite rapidly and these components, many of which were not exactly to proper spec. So the unit had lots of malfunction issues with feeding, extracting, and other sort of mechanical issues along those lines. And then finally, the added weight of all of this equipment actually slowed the vehicle down and it was no longer going to be able to keep up with the tanks that it was supposed to be guarding. So there was a lot of problems here. Um, basically, the vehicle was a failure in every way imaginable. And what makes matters even worse was that the brass knew this and they were actively concealing this, trying to fake it until they make it where they were showing the vehicle off doing demonstrations and basically these demonstrations were all bullcrap and they were doing this just so that the vehicle, the engineers can work on it behind the scenes and get all the bugs ironed out before, you know, anyone is the wiser. This whole fake it till you make it approach was being used by the army up until the early 1980s where finally this haul came to a head. Where there was going to be a important demonstration of this vehicle where it would go out, perform some maneuvers and blow some stuff up. 
attending this demonstration and who were going to be sitting in the audience were going to be many high-ranking officials of the U.S. military, the British military, other VIPs would also include members of the U.S. Congress. These individuals were all going to be sitting in some bleachers watching the show as the vehicle was going to perform its maneuvers. Well, during the show, one of the individuals who was operating the vehicle turned the fire control system on and the radar detected some enemy targets, to which then the vehicle did what it's supposed to do and the turret went ahead, swung around, and aimed at the targets in question. Regrettably, the targets were the audience themselves, and it was very disconcerting to have two live 40mm Bofors pointed directly at them in this type of instance. Shortly after this debacle, there was another failure of a demonstration where the U.S. Army just tried to rig the event as much as possible. Where they had a helicopter just hovering in midair, and in this helicopter they even had several bits of equipment that did nothing but emit more radar type emitting features just so that this thing could show up on the radar emitter and it still failed the thing still couldn't hit it which was an even bigger embarrassment already stacking up for this vehicle after a little while and even with more failure similar to that being reported on and being documented finally the u.s military as well as congress decided enough is enough and they pulled the plug on the project the program was scrapped, the whole DIVAD concept was abandoned, the M163 stayed the de facto self-propelled anti-aircraft vehicle for the U.S. military, and the remaining 50 vehicles that were produced either wound up in military museums or they wound up as range targets. And thus the end of the M247 Sergeant York story. Before we continue with the video, let's go ahead and take a step back to when this model was first started in order to get a good idea on what the base starter kit supplies you with. And here's the model at the start of the build. For the base starter kit, I'll be utilizing this 135th scale Vintage Academy M247 Sergeant York plastic model kit. This model here has been on the market now for a long period of time. This particular model has been in my stash for another long period of time where I first procured this exact kit here from eBay back in 2009. As I mentioned in the other Sergeant York video, during that time I was going on a patent buying binge and I was snatching up a large number of the available patent kits of that time in order to squirrel them away and build them from my own collection. Well, it's about time I finally get to this one here. If I scrape the surface of the box to clean it off, yeah, yeah, it's, it's been a while. So obviously 2009 was a very long time ago and in the years that passed, there has now been a new renowned interest in the patent-based vehicle, you know, kit market in 135th scale. And one of the brand new additions that has just been announced and is about to enter into production at the time of filming this video is a brand new Sergeant York kit from TACOM. After seeing the announcement, it kind of got me in the mood to build the Sergeant Yorks that I had in my collection as well as to repair the old one that I originally built when I was a kid. And in order to basically clear the landing field, so to speak, in preparation for the new TACOM kit, which I did pre-order, and I'm looking forward to that kit entering into my shop. So back to this example over here, the Sergeant York kits, for the longest period of time in 135th scale, have been very, very, very bare in terms of options on the market. In fact, there were literally only two, and both of them boiled down to the exact same tooling. The other option, of course, would be the Tamiya. Sergeant York that I have right over here, which by the way, once I crack open the box, you're definitely going to be seeing a comparison between the tooling of each, so stay tuned for that. But as for the Sergeant York in general, as we know, the Sergeant York was an abysmal failure in real life, and so because of that, there hasn't really been any interest in this vehicle until very recently, until the video games started to make this a playable vehicle in the video game. And oddly enough, it's really got a second life in popularity because of that, as opposed to just the general history of this vehicle being a failure. The original Sergeant Yorks were designed by Tamiya in 1983 or so, and that kid was on the market for a long period of time. However, to me themselves would stop production on them at some point in the 1990s, and the kits basically were just floating around in that skies. Well, 
in the early 1990s time frame, or I should say in the late 80s into the early 90s time frame, Academy decided to jump onto the bandwagon. Now, Academy during this era was known to basically be a kit pirate, and they would go around and snatch up other kits that were in production from other companies, make copies of them, and remold them and sell them under their own brand. Obviously, this is very, very shady, but this is something that was done quite a bit by Academy in the early years. In the 80s time frame, Academy was really more or less an upstart model company, so they didn't have nearly the capital to invest into their own original tooling, so they were kind of just leeching off of other companies until at some point they would stop doing this and tool up their own original kits, and this is something that Academy has been doing now since the like mid-1990s and onward. The Academy of today is not the same company in terms of the type of kits that they release as they were back in this era. However, the early Academy kits are very interesting in that own regard. And for those who are frequent viewers of the channel, you'll note that this isn't the first time an Academy knockoff kit has come across this desk. In the past, I've done three other examples of kits from Academy that were knockoffs. One of them was a 148 scale West German Canon. The other example was a 135th scale M551 Sheridan. And another example was the 135th scale US M48 A3 patent tank. Of which, this kit here is obviously going to be borrowing a large number of the components for, for reasons that should be fairly obvious. One other thing that's interesting to point out is that all three of the models that I just mentioned are motorized, one of which came motorized from Academy, while the other two were converted to be motorized by myself, which, spoiler alert, is going to be the story for this one over here. Uh, the other thing I want to mention is that Academy themselves also produced not the Sergeant York per se, but many of their other Tamiya knockoffs in a motorized format, and this was done years after Tamiya decided to pull away from that aspect of the hobby. And also on top of that, Academy, even to this day, will still release vehicles based on some of the Tamiya tooling, and they will offer it in a motorized or two-way wire remote feature. And many of these kits were never motorized by Tamiya themselves. They had the provisions to be motorized, but for one reason or, or another, Tamiya never went ahead and went the full step with it, releasing it as a motorization kit. Academy, on the other hand, did. So that is something that I find noteworthy. So back to the Sergeant York kit specifically, as I mentioned before, Back in the late 80s, early 90s, Academy decided to go ahead and jack the Tamiya tooling in order to reverse engineer it and turn it into the kit that we see here. And these kits were released in the early 1990s, and basically they stayed in production for a very long period of time. In fact, the Academy kits are more prolific compared to the Tamiya counterpart, as the Tamiya kits weren't really in production for that long of a time. They produced a lot of them, and they were you know, somewhat commonly found on the market, but the Academy one stayed in production for a longer duration. Tamiya only did really two batches. They, re they released them initially in the 80s, and then they re-released them again in the mid-2000s, but that was it. Academy, on the other hand, basically for almost 15 years, these things were in production, more or less. So they're very, very prolific because of that. There are two variations of this kit that are on the market. Both of them aesthetically look identical with the box art. The only difference is with some of the smaller graphic design cues that I'm going to be mentioning as I review the box art. But basically the kit was released in this format and then in 2002 or so, Academy was basically giving all of their models just a little facelift on the packaging and this kit here is one from that release, which I'll point out momentarily. Circling back to what I stated before about the production, these models, because they were so prolific, were extremely affordable. These models were able, back in the day, to be found in just about any of the mail order catalogs and later on online catalogs for prices starting for about 15 to about 25 US dollars at most. The Tamiya kit, on the other hand, you were going to be paying Tamiya prices, which was going to start at $35, and I've seen them back in the day go as high as about $60. So, obviously, these kits had a really nice little niche in the market. You're getting more or less Tamiya quality, but you were paying for a price tag that was much, much less in comparison. So, starting with the box art and the graphic design, here you get to see the artwork that's found right here on the cover. And this, unlike several of the other Academy Minicraft kits that came out earlier, namely like the Sheridan and the Patton, 
This one actually has a proper box art. In comparison, the older ones would have had just a picture of the model built and then just be a photograph of that with the graphic design overlay on top of it. But for these kits over here, they actually had a proper box art. It has the Sergeant York right here in the center with the Merc camouflage scheme, another one behind it. And we also have two M113 tow variant vehicles right there. Or if I'm not mistaken, I believe that might be a Fist V, which by the way is another vehicle that I actually did a model showcase video on a little while ago. An OTR specifically, but regardless, uh, the composition looks pretty good. And one thing that is a bit funny is that even the box art is arguably a copy of the Tamiya because it is quite literally the exact same angle, the same proportion, the same everything, even the same paint job as the Tamiya one. Only the Tamiya one admittedly has a better, higher quality illustration. But the Academy one isn't terrible, but you could definitely see that the illustrator that Tamir used was definitely a bit of a higher skill level, shall we say, compared to the one for the Academy box art. Having said that, the Academy box art is pretty iconic in its own respect because, again, of how common these kits were, they were, again, more commonly found than the Tamiya one. So, I guess Academy had the last laugh on that one. Moving up to the top, you get to see the main title and the typeface. And this is something that Academy used on many of their kits of this era. There we have the Academy logo right there in a prominent corner. 135th scale. And over here you can see this little bubble that says static model. This is something that Academy was doing on their models starting in the late 90s time period. And it went all the way up until the 2000s era. This little graphic was something that would not be present on some of the older release versions of the exact same kit. On the side tab here, you see the typical Academy built model example. As I mentioned before in the past, this here would just be the vehicle on the box art, but here they relegate it to the side section. These models are built straight up out of the box, no more, no less. It gives you a list of the kit's features. Here we have the side tab. This is kit number 1346 for those who are interested. And on this side over here, we have, well, a better built example, which kind of sort of mimics the Tamiya one that's in the Tamiya catalog, but I believe this one is actually the Academy counterpart. Regardless, the guy actually did a nice job on the Merc camo. I kind of like it. Here we have just a brief history of the vehicle. Or actually, no, this is all corporate information. They didn't even put that on the side of the box. And that's all there is to the outer portion. So let's go ahead and crack this one open in order to reveal the kit contents. The first thing that's gonna jump out at you is that this is an old school plastic model kit. The only components that are not made out of injection molded plastic are the poly caps and the single piece tracks over here, which are made out of vinyl, also known as God's chosen material. But I'll be going more about that later on. As for the plastic parts themselves, if anyone has seen the other Academy M48A3 build that I did a little while ago. All these components here should look identical because they literally are the exact same parts. All of the Academy components on this kit as well as on other kits from the same era are molded in this olive drab plastic. The color is very different compared to the Tamiya which was that tan color if anyone can recall from the other Sergeant York video that I had done. However, the moldings are identical. Looking at the parts even closer, you can see that all of the appropriate details are molded in for an M48. And just like on the Tamiya one, this is where the Academy goes off the rails because Tamiya botched their Sergeant York release by phoning in the rear hull area. They just went ahead and recycled the upper hull from the M48A3. And because of that, there's a massive mistake for the Sergeant York in that the entire Sergeant York rear deck does not look like this. The, the uh, Tamiya one obviously made this mistake and Academy blindly followed suit making the exact same mistakes as Tamiya. Oddly enough, Academy themselves would be the first to tool up their own M48A5 patent kit, but this would come in the mid 90s period. More information about that in another video for another day. As for the Academy one here, you can see that it has the same two little indication holes that one must drill out in order to add that ramp that goes on the back as Tamiya thought that would make it look more Sergeant Yorkie. Regardless, the 
the holes are still present with the little arrows indicating for you to drill them out. The only difference that this one says made in Korea as opposed to made in Japan, which the Tamiya one originally was. So I'll be comparing this molding, by the way, to the Tamiya one momentarily, so you really get to see exactly how much the two are alike and where the subtle differences are, but wait more on that. This run here consists of the remaining of the external fittings for both rigging up the turret as well as the hull. We have the F-16 conical radar, the spinny spin radar, the parts for the Bofors, the brush guards for the M40A5 headlights, and also the trunnion here for the Bofors themselves. Again, all of the components are decently rendered because all of the components are just copies of the Tamiya, which did a good job rendering out these parts, frankly. This runner over here is the M48A3 running gear. And just like Tamiya, Academy went ahead and just repurposed their A3 parts. Also, in case anyone is wondering, I actually had to pre-open this in order to fully build my M48A3 because if anyone can recall from that video, I had a snafu with the sprocket and I needed to make a mold and a resin copy of one of the pieces in order to get that model finished. But if it wasn't for that, these parts would still be sealed in the bag. I still have the sprocket, it's in the box here running around, but here you get to see the components. One thing that I do want to say is that there are some pieces on here that did not transition well into the copy version as opposed to the original Tamiya. One of which is with the flash. The parts have just a slight bit of flash on them in comparison to the Tamiya parts, which are admittedly cleaner in their overall appearance. The other thing I want to mention is with the sprocket, you will see on the center portion here that there is a distinctive sinkhole found in this area, and this is not present on the Tamiya tooling. Another thing I want to mention is that Academy went ahead and redesigned the sprockets. The Tamiya sprockets, which oddly enough are designed for a motorized tank and work fantastic in a motorized converted model, were redesigned by Academy over here to have this giant tower emerging from the rear section. Well, one thing I encountered on the other build is that this tend to cause interference if you are building the model static. And I believe I had to actually amputate these and cut them off. But this is a change that Academy made to their tooling opposed to the original Tamiya one. But this is something that's neither here nor there and I will be going over this more when I actually continue with the remainder of the build. So stay tuned for that. However, the remaining parts are just basically copy and paste Tamiya and look pretty good for the most part. The next runner is the turret and the turret is Nicely rendered because again, it's just copied from the Tamiya. However, they didn't just straight up copy the entire runner. I guess they didn't have that much shame. So what they went ahead and did was they took the actual moldings and they rearranged them on their own runner to better suit their tooling. Which you'll see that once I take it out of the bag and compare it with the Tamiya counterpart. On the bottom here, we got the other sprocket that I was referring to. And we have a set of polycaps. Just like the Tamiya tank, this kit here supplies you with a set of polycaps. However, the Academy polycaps, I notice, are a bit stiffer compared to the black rubber polycaps that are found on the Tamiya counterparts. However, both of them will still do the job just fine. And this takes us to the hull. And again, if anyone has seen the other M48 build, you'll know exactly what I'm referring to. So the hull is very Tamiya-ish. It has this one-piece assembly, has the little motorization cutouts in several of the, in the locations. However, on the Academy one, they added another hole, which is this large hole right over here in the center. And if I'm not mistaken, this is for the two-way wire remote wire to come out and run along the bottom portion of the vehicle. That's really the only significant change made by the Academy engineers as opposed to the Tamiya ones. However, on the inside here, we still have the pictograms for the batteries, the battery mounts, the bulkhead mounts, and also the provisions for the gearbox. But the gearbox provisions have also been changed somewhat compared to the Tamiya counterpart. Outside of that, the hull is basically identical. 
The last part I want to mention before I start doing the comparisons are the tracks. Just like with the Tamiya kit, the Sergeant York kit from Academy supplies you with the later style octagonal link track and is made out of the same single piece vinyl. The tracks themselves are also, spoiler alert, a copy of the Tamiya's where they have the tooth in the wrong location. However, the track is still a viable track and are still supplied with a large number of the Academy M60 pattern of kits that are in production today. Continuing further, takes us to the instructions and the decal sheet, which on this model here actually gives you an improvement over the Tamiya in that they give you more markings. The Tamiya markings were laughably shorter and smaller compared to the ones here on the Academy, so that's one thing that you could say the Academy did better on. As for the quality of the markings, honestly, I've had some mixed results with Academy decals in the past. Sometimes they're okay, sometimes less so. So we'll see how that turns out as the build goes on. Here we have the instruction sheet. Very, very Academy mini crafty. Now, by the way, this is not a mini craft release, but or Academy mini craft partnership release, I should say. But regardless, it, if anyone has ever worked on a vintage Academy kit, they'll know what I'm talking about. I will say that the instructions are pretty well thought out. They're not, I don't think they are straight up copies of the Tamiya. Nope, they are. Yep, they, they, this little graphic definitely is. That's, oh, and this is, this one's actually pretty funny. Uh, on this pictogram over here, it shows the model being inserted with a gearbox. Yeah, that's not the case on this model. Well, not right now it isn't, but stay tuned for that. Also, it's kind of funny. They tell you how to wire up the gearbox. Meanwhile, in the earlier pictogram over here, it just has the image of the areas getting plugged up. So that's a weird idiosyncrasy that this kit does have. It's kind of interesting to point out. So it's a mix between Tami illustrations and Academy illustrations. That is straight out of the Tami instructions. <laughs> that color, that little color chart over there, it's a good scan. But again, it's a nice little happy mix between Tami and Academy. Probably the most egregious, I think, though, was the Sheridan, where they actually had the original Tamiya box art, but in the instruction sheet. That, that took some balls. That was kind of funny. Um, oh, apparently over here, we have a little correction on some of the parts, I guess, to make up for the little idiosyncrasy found with the gearbox pictogram, which, by the way, if you're a kid building that, what a cock tease. I mean, you see that gearbox, it looks awesome, and then, nope, you got the cucked one, but we'll see about that. Also on the bottom of the box here, we have some other little warning thing in Korean, which I do not speak. And just basically read the instructions and don't swallow small parts. Good info to know. So now that you saw what the Academy kit gives you, let's go ahead and take the opportunity to compare it to an OG Tamiya one, since I literally can because I have both options here on the table. So the first thing we're gonna start with is the lower hull. And here you get to see the two options. Tamiya and Academy. Obviously the colors should tie you in. As you can see, the molds are basically identical with the exception of the large hole that Academy added to their tooling. One other thing to mention is that on the front portion here of the Tamiya, it's pretty smooth. There's a very tiny, slight, minute little dimple in this area over here, which is a sinkhole because on the inside we have a peg that protrudes for the insertion of a poly cap. On the Academy, obviously that peg is still there and Academy looks like they went ahead and made a modification to the peg, making it a little bit more pronounced. But you do have a more substantial sinkhole found right there and kind of acts more or less like a belly button. Obviously, this is something that is going to need to be paid attention to when I actually commence the build. Both models have the same seam lines running down the side portions here of the hull due to the way the molds were designed. Or more likely, these are just artifacts from the Tamiya counterpart. And on the inside here, you can see the pictograms. Right there is the Tamiya logo. And over here, it has the Korean information. And one thing about the old school Korean kits is that they have that typeface over there, which I presume says Academy Model Company. And it's in that really unique typeface that's only found on the vintage Academy kits of this era. 
Back here you get to see the gearbox motor mount. And you get to see the Academy counterpart. To me it has basically these angled rail sections, while the Academy one just has these pillars with these little pegs that are integrally molded on. More likely this was harder for Academy to render with their tooling and molding design, so they shifted to the design that we have here. Other than that little change there, you can really see that it's more or less a straight up copy of the Tamiya tooling. In fact, the Tamiya parts will work on the Academy and vice versa. And honestly, at this point, it, do I really have to say how much of a copy this is? I mean, if you seriously watch this video and are looking at these two pieces here and are telling me that no, this is Academy's original tooling, I don't have to tell you outside of you're an idiot. So we'll just go with that. Well, that's it for the lower hulls. Now let's take a look at the upper hull moldings. Again, Mr. Tamiya, and just for the sake of argument, there we go, right there, boom. To me, upper hull fits onto the Academy lower with zero problems. And just like with the lower hull, you will see that on the front portion here, the Academy does have a slightly more pronounced belly button compared to the Tamiya. Although if you look in the light just the right way, the Tamiya belly button will be there as well. On the engine deck area, if the camera could get nice and focused in on those louvers, you get to see what the to me, it one looks like, along with little molded and grab handles, in comparison to the Academies. The Tamiya one is slightly crisper in quality and detailing compared to the Academy counterpart, but it is like only fractions of a fraction better. I mean, it's once these things are fully painted, it, it'll look indistinguishable from one another. The real difference between the two kits isn't what's on the outside, it's really what's on the inside. So here you can look at the Tamiya. Note the smooth sections here on the sponsons, as well as on the interior. Very clean, no tooling marks to speak of. And in comparison, the Academy is a little bit rougher in this respect. You can see that the areas here of the mold were hit with some coarse grain sandpaper and left for some tooling marks. Very subtle, Not obviously it's not gonna be noticed specifically on the inside, but they are there in comparison to the Tamiya counterpart, which you can tell from the cleanness. Also again, on the Korean one over here, we have Made in Korea, and also more information along with that cool Academy typeface. And that is a change over from the original OG Tamiya. Other things to mention is that on the Tamiya one over here, it's really, really smooth. While for some reason, it must have been a small little change up with the mold because someone took a Dremel with a cutting stone to these two areas over here to remove some material in order, I guess, for the knockout marks to operate more properly. Outside of that, the knockout marks are still there from the original Tamiya and have been basically, I guess, repurposed for use on the Korean counterpart. With the turret out of the bag, you get to see the surface detailing. Again, very crisp, specifically because it is a copy. And if we compare that to the OG Tamiya one, you can see that Academy went ahead and redesigned the runner layout in order to better suit their molding machines. However, the quality of the two components are nearly identical. The one change on the surface that I noticed is right here on the front area. If we look at the Tamiya one, you'll see that there is a small little weld bead that's sculpted into this little section right over here. While on the Academy one, not only is the weld bead over there, but they went ahead and retooled it so that it looks a bit more pronounced. And to be fair, the weld bead sculpture actually looks pretty good. As for why they did this, honestly, I don't have an answer for that. If any mold engineers out there want to chime in, knock yourselves out. On the inside portion, not that it matters, but you could also see again that the Academy one is just slightly a little bit more cruder compared to the Tamiya counterpart, where we have a little bit of a grind mark over here while the Tamiya is smooth. The knockout mark pattern is a little bit different on the Tamiya compared to the Academy. Note we have a large circle 
right over there. And that's absent on the Tamiya one. And this is, by the way, all academic. This is just mold nerd stuff, so. Uh, one thing to mention, though, on the Tamiya one, the periscopes are molded hollow. They're solid on the outside, but they are molded hollow right here. And on the Academy one, I guess they figured that it wasn't necessary to do that, so they just basically molded them solid. Outside of that, in the knockout mark locations and the runner design that I mentioned, the two parts are, again, identical to one another. One of the other things that stood out at me were with the way the torsion bars were designed. So here we got the original Tamiya one. The layout of the runners are literally copy-paste. I mean, straight up copy-paste. Uh, you could probably see a little vortex thing going on because they are the same parts in the same locations. Only Academy added this tab over here for their brand name. And they modified slightly the A tab section opposite of the Tamiya. Again, if you think that, or if you don't think that the Academy kits are copies of the Tamiya, you're a fool. On the back portion here, you get to see some interesting changes. Where on the Tamiya, we have these little lightning cuts found right here on the back portion of the torsion bars. On the Academy, the torsion bar lightning cuts are deeper. Now, theoretically, this means the Tamiya ones are stronger. However, these parts are pretty robust. And since I have a motorized M4883 from Academy, the suspension holds up absolutely fine, and it's not a problem at all. And also, interestingly enough, the front torsion bar or swing arm mounts over here are solid on the Academy while they are hollow on the Tamiya. So, take that for what you will. One of the final runners to mention is this one over here, which contains the components for the turret and the upper hull. Tamiya was able to consolidate all these components on a single sprue. Academy went ahead and just separated the two out as you can see. Also, unlike the parts on the running gear, for this one here they didn't just exactly copy and paste the runners and they took the exact same parts but changed around the orientation to the way we have it here. Doesn't really mean much in the great scheme of things, it's, they are still the exact same parts, but it's interesting to see how Academy went ahead and thought about how to orient the parts in order to get the components molded in the way you see here for this kit. But needless to say, you can see that they are the exact same parts. Only it would be that way. Bouncing back to the suspension, the big difference that I wanted to point out was with the sprockets. Although, again, it's a you know copy and paste type setup, here you get to see the rear portions here of the Tamiya pattern of patent sprockets in comparison to the Academy. Note the Academy one has that extra bit of material over here for that hex drive section, and that's just not found on the Tamiya counterpart. As for why this was the case, honestly, I have absolutely no clue. But that's really the biggest change, component-wise, to this runner compared to the OG Tamiya one. The last thing I want to mention are the tracks. If you didn't know any better, I guess it would be hard-pressed to tell which are the two. Well, this one here is Academy, this one here is Tamiya. The Academy material is very similar to the Tamiya one in color and also in, in function, but the Tamiya one is better. The Tamiya one is more flexible. As you can see, the Academy one tends to be stiffer. And the Tamiya one is a little bit cleaner in terms of molding. However, the Academy ones are perfectly fine and will do the job just fine. It's one of those things where the Academy ones are okay, it's just that the original Tamiya ones are just a little bit better in comparison. But in the end, both will be able to do the job just fine. And for the lulls, here we have the Tamiya rubber polycaps and the Academy counterpart. The mold is very different between the two sections. The color is obviously different. But the big difference is the flexibility. The Academy ones are much stiffer compared to the Tamiya counterpart. 
So fast forwarding to where the model is in production. Basically this one here, the tank is mostly ready for painting and I'll touch upon that in a moment. But before I do that, there's one little bit of detailing that I always was bugged by this pattern of kit and it's something that I can finally now take care of and really it's the one thing that will improve the kit compared to its original offering and that involves the corner sections here of the tin work. So on the kit here, and again same is also true for the Tamiya, it is replicating an M48A3 and of course the real Sergeant Yorks were M48A5s. Why this is relevant is because on the A5, the one trait that they seem to all have is that the front fender sections here have this embossed X crimp found in these areas, much along the lines like you see here on the top. And this little bit of detailing is present prominently on the box art and it's one of those things that always eluded the kit and it was one of those things that kind of was a disappointment when I first built the model all those years ago and it's something that definitely can be improved. Of course, this arguably is like saying putting lipstick on a pig because, you know, all this is totally wrong, but let's just put a pin in that for the time being and go circle back to the tin work. So on this model over here, and this is specifically true for the Academy version, you'll notice that on the front area there are these two square cutouts found on the front tin work. These are carryovers from the M48 kit, which need to have these cutouts over here because there is a fender support that gets glued in place in both of these sections. Fair enough. However, on the Sergeant York kit here, those components are not included. So you have these two little ominous square cutouts that are present on the fender here, and they definitely need to be addressed. Now, normally you could just use a drop of red putty in here and then polish it down. And you know, that should by and large take care of the job. Although it's a little problematic because of the thinnesses here. You have to probably use plastic and reinforce and all that good stuff. But however, instead of doing that, I went ahead and finally took care of this one problem that this kit had. And that is with this runner that I have right here. So what this is, is a HD 3D printed set of tinwork inserts for the Tamiya or the Academy pattern of the M48 kit. This set here is a new addition to the EastCoastArmory.com 135th scale product line. It's funny, I actually have a 135th scale product line now. Only unlike the other components which are found on the ECA website, since these are 135th scale, these are found on the ECA Shapeway store. The link is found in the video description listed below. With this set here, you have enough fender sections here to outfit a total of three or four Sergeant York or M48 pattern vehicle. Why this is something I wanted to tool up? Well, one, it's kind of a niche thing you could say for the Sergeant York since these kits, you know, they're going to be put out the pasture soon because of the new TACOM ones. However, there's still a lot of the Tamiya M48 A3 kits that are floating around. And there are several versions of the M48 A3 that had these X crimps found on the front and rear fender plates. So if you're building your M48 and you want to render it in that type of a format, this set here would definitely be something to check out. As I mentioned before, there are enough plates on here to outfit three of these Tamiya or Academy M48 pattern or Sergeant York pattern of kits. And the details on them are basically intended to be a drop-in installation. So if the camera zooms in, you will see the detailing found on these components. Quite prominently, we have the X crimp right over there, which is an embossed bit of detailing on the real unit. And in addition to that, you can see the fender mounts right over here, which is a rigidity strip, and those are held on with some fasteners, and the other fasteners are present as well. All of these details are integrally printed onto this material, and since it is HD, it's going to have some very nice detail fidelity once secured in place and once thoroughly painted. To install the units, you are going to have to do a small little bit of prep work on the fenders themselves. The only prep work required is to sand away this little chunk here of the tin work. With the way the kit is, we have this little strip that's integrally molded on, and it's present here on the front portion. Obviously, this needs to go in preparation for the new piece, and as I touched upon before, that piece detailing is integrally printed on. So with a needle file or just some sandpaper, you just simply polish that down nice and flat. Once that's done, the piece is then ready to be installed in place. A similar procedure needs to be done to the one on the back as well, because for the exact same reason. These pieces here are a mirror image, so installing them to their appropriate location is something that's going to be fairly easily done. Okay, so the prep work has been done on the tin work. You can see here it's been sanded nice and flush. This was done with the sandpaper. I also used a file 
here or there, but really the sandpaper I think is a better way to go because with the file you run the risk of potentially sanding too much material in an uneven manner, which is not exactly doing you any favors. So sandpaper was done after a few passes, it blends down to the way you see it here. So from this point onward, I could go ahead, remove the panels off of the sprue here and get them ready for the installation. On the set itself, the two top ones over here, which are smaller, they're for the front, and the two wider ones are for the rear. They're pretty easy to follow, so there's nothing really much to mention there. As for the components, which one goes where, like I stated before, they are a mirror image from each other, and they're really easy to determine. The one with the rib goes where the rib once was originally, and vice versa. So with um, clean cut snips here, I'm just gonna go ahead and snip these fellas off of the sprue. Just like so. And to deburr further, I have here a needle file. I'm just gonna run it along the bottom portion, which is going to polish away that little sprue section that was just sniffed. Once it's thoroughly polished away, at least for a nice smooth surface. This is something where the surface is going to be very relevant because obviously if there's a bump over there, it's gonna inhibit the installation of the fender tip. And that's something that you definitely don't want. And here's what the model looks like with those new 3D printed components installed. As you can see, they really give that nice added bit of detailing that was just absent on the stock kit. Obviously, once the model is fully painted and weathered, these are really going to come out tenfold. Specifically, once that accent wash gets in there, highlighting all those little crimped areas. Same is also true, of course, for the ones on the rear, right over here. And if we compare that with the stock one, of course this is the Tamiya counterpart, but either will work. You can really see how it transforms the piece without really all that much extra effort. In addition to securing on in place, I went ahead and added some thick super glue on these two areas here where the printed component makes contact with the hull. Once the super glue sets, I polish down with some sandpaper, blending it in, which will make for a cleaner look once fully completed. And that's really all there is to that. So as I touched upon earlier in the unboxing, probably the biggest change that needs to be done on this model here is involving the sprockets. And not necessarily for the motorization aspect, but just to build as a static model. As I touched upon before, and as well as in the other M48 video, on the Academy kit here, they went ahead and added this extra collar to the sprocket itself. And if you assemble it out of the box, it's not going to fit onto the tank properly. And you need to remove and amputate this collar over here just to get the piece to fit on in its proper manner. On this sprocket over here, it already went through the revisions of not just amputating the collar, like you can see right over here, but I also went ahead and added several of the other details which are used to improve the sprocket overall. First thing I did was I added the mud slits, which again is something that is almost always absent on these patent family of vehicle kits. And on this one here, you notice that I went ahead and drilled out the center portion and, pl and added a plastic plug on that portion right there. The reason why this was done was, well, you could see it right here on this example, there is a killer sinkhole found right there in the center, and again, this is probably one of the softer, weaker aspects of the Academy tooling model. The Tamiya, less so. To me, it's, it's a little bit <laughs> more thought out in that regard, but as, uh, you know, anything goes, whenever you clone something, there's a little bit of degradation that happens, and that's what you're going to see over here. But if that's, you know, the least of the problems, and or if that's the worst of your problems, I should say, that's really not too bad, all things considered. Regardless, on this bracket over here, this was addressed, and as you can see, it's much more improved. The next thing I want to mention is with this little insert that we have right here. So, normally, if this was static, this would not be an issue. You simply install the poly cap and you assemble accordingly. However, because this model is motorized converted, there needs to be some extra additions added. So obviously this collar over here is required because there's that hex nut that's used to plug onto the gearbox and it prevents it from slipping and it allows the model to drive. Well, when you amputate that section, you're not exactly going to be able to use that system anymore. So what I went ahead and did was I went ahead and developed this piece here which replaces the poly cap that's found on the inside. Rather than a poly cap, we have here the hex insert. This here is meant for use on the Tamiya pattern of gearbox spindle and it'll just slide directly into place locking it on and then allow the sprocket to rotate. 
In order to secure this in place, I am going to add quite a bit of glue on the inside over here just to make sure that's nice and solid so that the piece will stay nice and true when it comes time for insulation and it won't spin or loosen on you. This piece here I went ahead and added to the hex runner as I b believe I ran out of these hex inserts from all the tanks that I've made motorized in the past and I'm going to be making an amendment to this set here adding some more of these components but that's something I'm going to be touching upon later on. Currently on the ECA 135 scale catalog I do have this set posted which is just all these little hex sections which are used for again motorized or RC converting a model and specifically it's used to adapt it to fit onto the Tamiya dual motor gearbox hex shaft that we have right here. I've touched upon this in a few other motorized converted videos and the piece works really really well and it's one of those things that if you are interested in doing any type of motorized conversion it's definitely worth checking out. So since the other sprocket was done off camera I'm going to go ahead and walk you through the process in order to prep these sprockets for installation and also for motorization use. So the first thing that needs to be done regardless of motorization or static is you got to remove this extra bit of material found here on the sprocket. This is something that can easily be removed with the use of a file like I have right over here just run up and down the surface until the material is removed. However, to save a little time, I'm going to go ahead and cut this section off on my bandsaw. That is going to be done off camera, but you'll see what it looks like once the material is removed. Once I go ahead and cut that section off with the file, I can just go ahead, move it up and down the surface to square it off. And that's really more or less the more important, but that needs to be done. Once that bit of material is cut away, you can see me squaring off the piece. And this is something you want to do very carefully because you want to make sure the material is removed evenly. As if it isn't removed evenly, it may cause a problem with the alignment. And that's definitely something you want to avoid. Okay, that should do the trick. There's a little bit of burrs and remembrance left over from the cutting and sanding process. But that just cleans away either with your fingernail or with the use of a needle file and or... Exacto blade. But once it's cleaned up, you can see just how much better it looks now. Okay, so now that that has been taken care of, the next thing I'm going to do is focus on the outer stem. So the first thing I am going to do is drill out the center portion right over here to address that pretty gnarly sinkhole. In addition to that, I am also going to come to think of it, deburr the two sections here where the sprocket made contact with the sprue, but that's something that can be done with, you know, any little bit of modeling tools. The most important thing though is drilling that out. To drill this out, this is something that I'm going to be doing on the lathe because the lathe will ensure a nice square hole directly dead center in this piece over here, which is really what you want in order to get that plug fitted in place in a nice flat manner. If you don't have a lathe, which most people out there don't, the same procedure can still be done on a drill press if you have access to that. And let's just say we're going full-blown caveman mode in terms of tooling. You can still do the same procedure with a pin vise. But, you know, this can still be done, but you have to be very careful making sure that the hole is being drilled in a nice, straight, and true manner. As long as you get the hole drilled nice and straight, you're going to still be able to do the task even with the most bare minimum of modeling tools. And if you don't have that and you're feeling uncomfortable with that, just build it out of the box in that regard and, you know, call it a day. However, still remove this bit of material over here. This has to be done because you're just not going to be able to get this thing installed onto the model without it. Here's the sprocket now after the lathe drilled out the center portion. The lathe obviously did a fantastic job with drilling out this inner area over here. What makes it easier is that with this design of sprocket, we have this little stem that comes out, which is the perfect place for the jaws to grab onto the piece nice and true and doesn't cause any damage to the bell housing or to the teeth themselves. The hole that was drilled is an eighth of an inch which is great. It's a nice simple drill bit to find. It's a common size and on top of that it's really easy to plug and furthermore it's the correct scale for the actual sprocket inner hub itself. So it's a win across the board. For the plug, I'm going to utilize this little snippet of plastic that we have right here. This is just some sprue that I just took out of the recycle bin that's off screen and I'm just going to recycle it and use it to plug up this hole here. The sprue itself, it's an eighth of an inch. Again, eighth of an inch is a really common size used for sprues. So, you know, it's definitely not something that's hard to come by. This one here is Dragon. I couldn't tell you the kits. It is a newer generation kit, judging by the plastic color and the feel, but that's neither here nor there. As for the piece itself it was squared off on the lathe so it's nice and true and basically I'm just going to snip just a little bit off it just like this here 
And this now is going to become the new plug. What I am going to do is with a drop of super glue, I'm going to put it right there on the inner portion of the hole. And this guy here is just going to slide directly into place. You may have to use a tweezer of some sort in order to get it into the confines, but once you do, it will just slide directly where it needs to go. And once in place, you can see just how much better the sprocket looks now compared to before with that unsightly sinkhole found in the middle. So the last thing I am going to do before I go ahead and fully assemble this sprocket is I'm going to add the mud slits. And this is again for the same reason I touched the palm before, so there's no point re-threading that. Before I can do that though, I need to mark where they go. And this is something that I am again going to do on the lathe. Not so much for the actual drilling, but I am going to turn this on the lathe in order to put two pencil marks on either side here. And the lathe is going to put a nice straight line on these two locations, which is going to be the perfect margins in order for me to mark the horizontal line that's going to be needed to drill out that little bit of material. So let's go ahead and swing over to that. Uh, oh, if you don't have a lathe and you want to do the same procedure, it could still be done and it can still be done the monkey way. What you do is you do that old trick where if you have an electric drill, you put this stem here in your truck, you put the drill in the vise, you put it on at slow speed, and then you could basically now have an ad hoc vice. So if you want to do it the professor way from Gilligan's Island, that way we'll also do the same job. And it's a nice, clever way to work around in case you don't have something fancy like a machine lathe. So there are the pencil lines that have been drawn. And again, I just want to mention, if you don't feel comfortable with doing this technique, don't do it. This is something that is not necessarily a must-have bit of detailing found on this pattern of vehicle. As I've touched upon in basically every one of these patent videos, there were examples of M48 and M60 patterns of sprockets that the subcontractor did not add the mud slits to. So this is something that is not necessarily a must-have bit of detailing, but if you have the capabilities of adding that detailing, it's definitely something that can help the build overall. But again, this is technically optional. So I just want to put that forth in case someone's watching this and are feeling really uneasy about the steps at hand. So now that the <laughs> disclaimer is out of the way, when you're marking the lines, you want to make sure and, and keep aware of the bottom line here to make sure that you're above the fasteners. As if you're drilling through and it's a little low, you can hit the fasteners causing some damage. So that's something you want to avoid. So you want to take some measurements accordingly. So the next thing you want to do is to add the slits locations themselves. And there are three of them and they're basically in a triangle type format. So I'm just going to go ahead and add one over here. And uh, basically I just use the sprocket teeth over here as a guide in how to do that. And although I've done this a hundred plus times, now that I'm on camera, it's going to be off center because, you know, I'm trying to work with a camera in front of me as opposed to just doing this on my lap. So there goes the line that has been drawn. And now I'm just going to go ahead and carefully mark the other two. And I am going to do this off camera just so I make sure that it's nice and level. Okay, they have been added. So we have one, two, and three. And to drill this out, this is something that you have to have a Dremel for. For the bit itself, I am going to be utilizing this set here of small router bits. And obviously, again, from Drill Bits Unlimited, it's like the vendor that I always use and I mention in these videos. And here go the size right there of the carbide router bits. These are the smaller ones. And what I like about these is that they are the correct size of the mud slit itself. So no other expanding or other alterations need to be made. Only thing I do is use this to drill the top hole, the bottom hole, and then carefully remove the material in the center. And boom, you have your oval for the mud hole present on your 135th scale patent sprocket. And the Dremel does a short work with getting the mud slit holes drilled out. And as you can see, once added, it really does improve the look of the model overall. So at this point here, it's ready for assembly. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to find the box that has the other parts in it. And at this point here, if you're building the model static, you just follow the kit instructions. Namely, you put the poly cap on the inside over here. You put those two retention rings, the, the alignment rings, I should say, on the stem. And then the top portion goes on, secures in place, and you're good to go. However, because this one is going to be motorized converted, I have to change one of those steps, namely the poly cap. 
as I touched upon before, rather than using the rubber poly cap in its place, I'm going to use that new 3D printed insert in order to lock this component to the drive shaft that's currently fitted on the gearbox found on the hull itself, which you will definitely be seeing momentarily. And here's the last step of the installation, and that's getting that little insert in place. The 3D printed insert needs to be super glued firmly to the inside portion of the sprocket, so you want to use a decent amount of glue. Obviously not too much glue, you don't want a bathtub in there, because obviously if the center portion is plugged up with glue, it's going to be pretty hard to install it onto the sprocket or I should say onto the spindle. So you want to have a decent amount of glue on the sides. Another thing you do is with thin super glue that I have like right here, you go ahead and have it flow into the side sections in order to make sure that the piece has absolutely as much glue as possible on its surfaces in order for the thing to be rock solid. I have to stress that and I cannot stress that enough. This piece needs to be absolutely rock solid. This is what's going to hold all of the weight of the, or, or I should say all of the inertia of the tank or the model. And also it's going to take all of the strain from the rotation of the sprocket there or from the gearbox to spin this thing and to overpower the tracks and to propel this model. So this is absolutely crucial to have this thing as solid as possible. So once that part is done, you then go ahead and add the glue like you would normally, like so. And then this piece then gets dropped directly into place as it would normally. Now, as for that insert, it is slightly longer than it needs to be. I actually have to shorten it about a millimeter or a millimeter and a half or so in order for it to fit into the into the recess here in an appropriate way. This is something that I'm probably going to end up adjusting on the production set, so this is something that uh, will be mentioned probably in other videos. But the next thing I want to mention, and this is also true for just about all these tank models, after you have the sprocket glued together like that, take the track and basically wrap it around to see if the timing is where it needs to be. Obviously timing is super important on tank models and it's double more important on ones that have to function. So as you can see, the timing lines up absolutely perfectly, which is good. I just wanna visually check it. Yep, all right, everything is good to go. The sprocket here is now fully assembled. The next thing I gotta do is adjust the length here on the axle so that this piece fits on and aligns absolutely perfectly. On that note, you'll see that right now the model has some wheels attached. These wheels and this track, or I should say the track that you see on this model for that matter, these are from a, another Tamiya Sergeant New York model that I'm currently building alongside this one and the other Tamiya kit that I showed earlier. And that one's getting the full OTR treatment. That is of course gonna be the topic of its own subject on its own uh, OTR video and more on that is to come but for the time being I'm actually borrowing the suspension here or the running gear I should say just so that I can test this model here to make sure that everything is lining up appropriately the tr the wheel the wheels that come with this model here are, of course are going to be used but right now they're still sitting on the runner because they need to be painted first prior to the in assembly and installation so while I have these wheels over here on hand I might as well use them for this purpose for the time being so at this point here I want to have the wheels on the axle and you want to basically visualize where the sprocket needs to go. And on these patent vehicles here, it's actually fairly easily done because you have this center tooth guide over here and you basically just eyeball line it up with the center portion here of the road wheel. Once you do that, you can mark exactly where it needs to go and then you can remove this small bit of material found on this axle and then clean it up and after that, the sprocket can be inserted in place. While working on the assembly of the turret, the one thing that you need to start with first is with the mantlet. The mantlet is absolutely crucial to pre-assemble at this point here because once you progress past this point, you're not really going to be able to get a whole lot of access to this component. So starting with the part, it is a three-piece assembly. We have these two halves here that form the main drum portion of the mantlet. And then there's a, a cover face that goes right on the front portion that gives you the front detailing, also the provisions for mounting the 40 millimeter barrels. However, there is going to be some seam work to contend with at this point here because if you don't address it at this point, once it's fitted to the model, you're not going to be able to get access to these locations very easily or at all. And unfortunately, even though it's one of those places where you're not going to be able to get access to it, you are definitely going to be able to see the seam work and it can hurt and detract from the look of the final build. 
So at this point here, or I should say slightly before this point here, before the front plank gets glued on, the upper and lower sections get assembled as per the kit. At that point there, I then go through the seam removal process. This is just done with some basic sandpaper and a little bit of elbow grease. Once everything is polished down, at least for a nice smooth appearance like you see here, and then you can commence with the remainder of the assembly, namely the addition of this plug here on the bottom and also the faceplate. For the faceplate, there is no seam work to contend with because there is a natural seam found in this section over here, and if you leave it as per the kit, you're going to have the appropriate result. One other thing I want to mention at this time about this component are with these four little pegs. These four little pegs are integrally molded into the kit and they are nicely molded. However, they are very, very frail. So frail that during the course of construction, not even the seam removal process, just regular construction, I bumped into them cracking them off. With one of the pieces cracked off, or I think it may have been a little bit more than that, maybe one or two, regardless, you have to then amputate all four of them and replace them, otherwise it's not going to keep continuity. So all four of the little plastic pegs were deleted. With the pin vise, I drilled out new sections, and then with some small wire from a sewing pin, I was able to fabricate the replacement bits. Once all the pieces are glued in place, I polished them down with some sandpaper to level them off and also to deburr them and once that's complete the piece is now fully restored and it's back to its appropriate look. One last thing I want to mention before I go ahead and go through the assembly process is that this piece here needs to be thoroughly primed prior to the installation on the model. Just like with the the bodywork, once this thing is fitted in place, you're not going to get a whole lot of access to this location over here and something like this with this type of geometry is just going to be asking to have bare exposed areas left unpainted, which needless to say is something that never is beneficial and will always hurt the look of the final result. So this is going to get primed off camera with some flat black primers, I usually do. And in addition to that, I don't have the parts right here on the table with me, but the other components that need to get primed as well are the interior well sections that the mantle here is actually cradled on. If you look at the Sergeant York, there's some shelves or walls in these areas over here to allow the thing to pivot. And these areas here are also going to get the primer prior to assembly for the exact same reasons that I just touched upon with the mantle. And at this point here, the model is built and it's ready for painting. I do want to touch upon certain key attributes that the model has at this point here because once it's fully painted and weathered, you're really not going to get to appreciate them as much as you do during this point here. The remainder of the details, which I did add, are going to be touched upon in more depth as the video goes on. But at this point, the first thing I want to mention is with the lower hull. And you'll see that at this point here, all of the lower hull extremities have been covered with the cast texturing. This really does twofold. First, it improves the accuracy of the model, give, making it more detailed compared to leaving everything smooth. But also, it acts as a way to conceal the seam line that's found right here on the frog nose where the upper and lower hulls meet. This is something that obviously needs to be there because the top needs to be removable. If this was a static model, you could get away with that a little bit by just, you know, blending this area in and calling it a day. However, because this model does need to come apart, this is something that is needs to be addressed specifically on the model at this point. With the way the cast texturing is, once the cast texturing is applied and once everything is painted, it does a much better job in concealing everything compared to just having the seam right there for everyone to notice. I already touched upon the X crimps found on the 3D printed parts earlier, but again, now that they are fitted to the model, they do look pretty good. While on the topic of 3D printing components, we have here these two little triangular lift rings found on the rear portion here of the engine deck. These were originally integrally molded into this section over here, albeit in a finely molded manner where, you know, they're not as deep or as pronounced as they are say on the Tamiya one, but they were still there. The reason why they were amputated and deleted was because when I was installing the skateboard ramp section in place here, the bodywork polished down the original molded in triangles. So rather than trying to save them, I just simply rem removed them all together. These pieces here were spare from the AFV Club M88 project that I recently completed. And in that video, I had to produce these components and these were just some extra spares that I had on hand. So rather than having them languish away, I simply just use utilize them on this build here. It's technically not accurate because again, the rear of the Sergeant York is completely different here, but you know, hey, I might as well add these parts at this time just in order to give it just a little bit extra detailing albeit maybe not the most accurate but hey at least it's something and it gives for a little bit more uniqueness on the turret 
Again, pretty much stock, but you can see here that I went ahead and replaced the molded in handles with pieces of bent floor wire. There are about four of these handles that are integrally molded on. They're basically just little blades that are found on the surfaces. They were promptly removed and the new ones were added in place. This always improves the detailing on any plastic model regardless of scale. On the side sections here you can see the smoke grenade launchers and as I typically do on these builds I drill a small little hole and I add the little firing cable which would be present on the real units is just some small floor wire that has been bent to shape and added to the side of the model. This is something that's done to both sides and again it's just a way to add a little bit of extra detailing to the build without really a whole bunch of extra work. On a similar note on the rear portion over here we have the two antenna bases and what's really cool is that on the Sergeant York they are mounted in this type of a format. The base mounts themselves are the kit originals. They were simply utilized out of box. However, the antenna base mounts themselves are basically almost non-existent on this kit here. So what I went ahead and did was I polished away the detailing found on the two sections and I added a cast resin post-World War II antenna base that we have on each side. This here was something that I've touched upon in a number of these other post-World War II and M60 pattern vehicle vid videos where on one of the Tamiya builds, I actually made a mold of the kit component in order for use on builds just like this. The piece simply gets casted, the detailing is pretty good on them, and then I could just drop them on any vehicle I deem fit. And that's exactly what happened over here. This is definitely going to be more appreciated once the model is fully painted and weathered, and specifically once the antenna wires are in place. And it just looks really cool, specifically with all the radars and stuff that's going to be mounted to this model once that point does come. But as you can see, it definitely adds a little bit more extra juice for this turkey. Just like on all M48 models, the bow hatch is fully removable, and by M48 I'm talking about the Tamiya pattern ones. So the hatch is fully movable. Basically the way this works is you melt the stem a little bit with a soldering iron on the inside, and this allows the hatch to be fully functional. It's one of those things where it's a cool little feature, it's a why not bit of detailing. It's not really that practical, but again, literally, why not? You just five seconds with a soldering iron and boom you got a little bit of extra functionality. Probably the biggest area that needed a little bit of revisement was right here on the back section where the engine deck meets the grill work. For some reason on this one here the fit was pretty loose and was fairly wobbly. Now if the model was static this wouldn't be a problem you just glue it in place and you know it's going to be held there and without any issues. However because this model is motorized again the top deck needs to come off so there's more emphasis required on this area over here. On this one I actually had to build up some layers of plastic using Plastruct and then everything was just flared in with the bodywork. Um, this is unique because on the other M48, I didn't have this problem. I don't know, just maybe it was the way that one turned out. But this one here, I just need the extra steps. Also, where the hull section over here, there's this little gap. This was filled in with some more Plastruct. And then I was able to add the hinge work that's supplied with the kit in those locations there. The next thing to mention is with the guards that come right down on this section here of the final drive. This is a really important bit of detailing found on these patent based vehicles and if you're making the model motorized they tend to be a pain in the ass because these are supposed to be connected to the top tin work and if the tank is static no big deal you just glue them in place and you're good to go. However because again the top needs to come off this is, needs a little bit of a creative solution and this was something that fortunately I basically figured out a number of builds ago on one of the other M60 motorized builds that I've done and I just rinse washed and repeated for the pattern. So the way this is executed is when the model's fully together it looks like that everything is connected in place and these are connected to the top hull. However that is an illusion. These pieces are actually not connected to the top and are actually connected to the final drives as you can see right there. This allows you to basically have your cake and eat it too. You get the detailing, but you also have the ability to take the deck or the top section off without causing any sort of hangups on this area here. With the top portion removed, you get to see what the inner guts look like. So here's the Tamiya dual motor gearbox fitted in place permanently at this time. It's held in place with fasteners as well as a bunch of silicone. Silicone is great because it not only does a good job with keeping everything in place, but since it's a soft rubbery material, it helps absorb some vibrations from the motors and the gearbox itself. Here we have the power plant which is just two AA batteries. And here goes the switch system. The switch itself 
pop this guy off. The switch itself is a three-way switch, which allows the model to go in both forward and reverse, which is a nice little trick. In order to wire to do this, in the comments, or I should say in the video description below, I have a quick little schematic that shows how to wire a switch in order to execute this type of a setup. It's one that it has a little bit more complexity to the wiring, but it's still one that works really good and it's a really cool feature to have your tank go forward and backward. On the switch access, well this is something that's interestingly uniquely done on the Academy version and, well, it was so good I didn't really mess with it. On the bottom portion over here, as we recall, there's a giant hole found in the lower portion of the hull. This originally would have been for, I believe, the two-way wire remote wire to exit out of, but on this one here, it's a perfect place to mount the access for the switch. There's a switch mounted right there, dead center. In order to turn it on with some kind of a stick, you just basically hit the switch, and you can go from off to forward and or reverse. I am going to mark the direction on this area of here of the hole with a little bit of paint, but that's going to be done after everything is painted. Why this is great is that it doesn't have anything descending from the lower portion of the hull, and for all intents and purposes, it basically has the same profile as the static counterpart. The next thing that's noteworthy about the model here, specifically for the motorization conversion, involves the front axle. With the way the model is designed, you have these two little pegs that get inserted into these areas here of the front axle sections. Once the glue sets, it allows you to put on the wheels, and you're good to go. And that works fantastic for a static model. However, for a motorized model, eh, now, it leaves some room for improvement. Even Tamiya themselves, back in the day, would have done a system like this, and I'm pretty sure the Academy motorized tank does the same exact feature, where we have just a piece of steel that runs across this section over here, either brass or whatever. It's a metal rod, it's continuous, it goes and it bridges the two wheels in place. It gives extra strength, and this thing isn't going to be going anywhere. Fortunately, the axles and the axles found on the vehicle are eighth of an inch so it's really easy to find material in that size this is just an eighth of an inch piece of steel on past builds i've even used brass it just depends on what i have in the shop and this time steel is the way to go on the inside over here in order for the battery to fit in place i deleted those battery plug sections that are integrally molded on this just frees up the inside a little bit more and allows the battery to flusher on the inside, which causes less of a problem during the mounting of the upper deck. And while I have the upper section off, this brings me back to the side sections and the cast structuring and why this was also added. In addition to adding the extra detailing, as I mentioned before, it's also a way to conceal the other little slots and holes that are found on the side portions here of the M48 hull. As we can recall, there's a slit found in this section over here, and another one found in the front, and as you can see, they're all blended away. This was done with chunks of plastic that were added to these areas, sanded flush, and then in order to conceal everything further, the cast section here does the remainder of the work. With the model back together, before I go ahead and shift over to when this thing is fully painted and completed, I might as well give it a quick test drive. And by the way, if I'm not mistaken, I believe that this is the first 135th scale Sergeant York model that has been converted to be motorized on the internet or specifically even on YouTube. I don't want to say the world, uh, I don't want to be that uh, braggadocious, but so far as far as I can tell I've yet to see anyone else do something like this in 135th scale. So let's go ahead and mark the occasion by firing this thing up. Here she goes in reverse. Or is that going forward? Nope, it's going forward. And as you can see, it already has quite a nice bit of speed to it. And as you can see, this thing runs fantastic in both forward and reverse. There's no illusion that this thing has with keeping up with the tanks. Can't really say the same about the real Sergeant York, but at least my model one over here, that's definitely the case. Starting with the model suspension, all of the running gear components are assembled with the out-of-the-box method because the out-of-the-box system works pretty well. This is a Tamiya pattern vehicle, so all the road wheels have a polycap type insulation, and it does hold them onto the wheel nice and securely, but allows the wheels to fully rotate, which for this particular vehicle here, it's going to be fairly important for reasons that should be pretty clear. As for the return rollers, these are again the kit supply ones, and unlike the road wheels which secure on with a polycap, these are held in place with the hubcap, but it's a plastic stem, so basically the wheels can pivot freely, but the hubcap stays firmly in the static position. From the row wheels takes us to a 
bit of detailing that I forgot to mention earlier when the model was being constructed, and that is with the rear road wheel cluster. You see, the M48 originally had a trailing idler, and this was something that was a design and it was an appendix carryover from the M47 and the M46. By the M48A3 configuration, the trailing idler was eliminated. However, the provision for mounting the trailing idler was still found on the rear wheel mounting castings. Even though the piece was not there, they would have a plate bolted into this section over here and that would just close up this hole and prevent, you know, things like moisture or other muck from getting inside the vehicle. Well, for some reason, the Tamiya kit negated to give you this bit of detailing and this bit of, I should say, this absence of this detailing over here carried over into the Academy tooling. Now, in the past, I actually tooled up a set specifically for this pattern of vehicle, being the Academy slash Tamiya M48 family of vehicles, and it was a HD 3D printed runner that contains all of the little hubcaps, or I should say cover caps, that are intended to be inserted into this section over here, plugging up this hole. This bit of detailing was added to this model. Unfortunately, you can't see it when the model is fully completed. However, it is there. I'll go ahead and throw up some thumbnails of what the piece looks like, as well as what it looks like once fitted to one of these patterns of vehicles. This little detailing here, it's one of those things that even though you don't necessarily get the chance to see or specifically from this camera angle, however, it's one of those things that always bugged me as uh, a younger person. And now that I finally have these pieces and they are fitted in place, it just makes the model that much more complete in my opinion. Continuing with the suspension brings us to the rear drive sprockets. Now that the model's in its final form, you really get to appreciate the modification work that I touched upon earlier. The mud slits are always a modification that super polishes one of these models and it just gives that much more accuracy and fidelity to the model overall. As I touched upon before, this is something that is best done with someone that has the tools and techniques to undertake. And if you are the person that does have those prerequisites, the addition of the mudslits is something that I cannot recommend enough on any of these patent family of vehicle builds. From the suspension takes to the lower hull, and hopefully with the model placed on its side, I should have some better lighting in order to highlight the cast texturing that was touched upon earlier in the video. As I mentioned before, the cast texturing was added to the entire lower hull and sections of the upper hull in order to blend in seams and also to just give the model just that much more detailed fidelity. The cast section should be popping up on the screen right now in this section here, but it was also added to the sides, and most notably to the front frog nose. While on the frog nose, you get to see the texturing here in better light, and also you get to see the other details found on the front, such as the bow headlights and the br headlight brush guards. As I touched upon before, for the Sergeant York, you do have to make some slight modifications to the model in order to drill out certain sections for these fittings to be fitted in place. These are clearly labeled in the instructions, and if you take your time and follow the instructions, you should be able to install these parts without any sort of issues. Also in this area over here, you get to see the fire extinguisher box, and in a typical manner, the little levers are painted in red, which is how they would be seen on the actual vehicle. Before departing from the front, I of course have to mention the front tin work. The X crimps, now that they are fully painted and weathered, really do enhance the model compared to the original kit offering. Also, once everything is thoroughly blended in, you can see how it fuses into the remainder of the model's tin work, and unless I mentioned it, I doubt anyone would notice that th these sections here were not originally molded into the model's tooling. And once added, you can see just how much more improved the model looks overall. This is true for not just the sections in the front, but also for the sections fitted on the rear. One last thing I want to mention is with the cat's eye taillights, here you get to see the pieces fully painted in the appropriate manner, where the one here on the left, the top portion is painted in red, and the silver section is on the bottom, while the one on the right hand side, it's a blackout light, so the top section is painted with gloss black. However, the, the white light there is still painted in silver, which is the way it would be found on many real examples of these vehicles. These details are integrally molded on, but the, again, the only thing the builder has to do is to properly paint them. I've seen a lot of builds out there where a lot of people, they just take one little drop of red paint and they just paint the entire face of the light, which is definitely something that you don't want to do. And it's one of those things where if you have a fine little paintbrush and the right paints, you just add them to the appropriate locations and the build's detailing definitely is improved overall. 
Hopping back periodically to the tracks takes us to the stock tracks, as I mentioned before. These are the single piece vinyl tracks, and because the model is motorized, this is something that's very important for this build. The tracks are the non-directional octagonal links, as I mentioned before, but here you get to see what they look like fully painted and weathered. Unlike the Chevron pattern of track, where the entire pad section is made out of rubber. On the octagonal links, only the octagonal faces themselves are rubber, while the remaining section of the track is made out of steel. So on the model here, I weathered it accordingly. If you're working on a vehicle with this pattern of track, this is something you want to pay attention to because you can easily mistakenly weather sections that are steel, which are actually rubber and vice versa. Section of the track, it's your typical American pattern where we have the two rubber pads that are divided by the guide tooth are actually rubber cladded. And this is so that these sections here make contact with the road wheels. On the model over here, you just want to properly paint these sections as such. The skeletal sections are made out of metal and so that they are weathered in the same format as I touched upon with the sections found on the front portion of the track bands. Once you properly paint the tracks on one of these vehicles, it really enhances the build overall and it's just something that makes it look that much more polished. Moving along, the side teamwork takes to the side tow cables. There's one on each side of this vehicle and these are the kit components just simply painted and fitted to the model. This is something you do have to pay a little bit of attention to on the build, not so much with fitting the pieces in place or with painting so much, but more or less with being careful not to break them during the course of sprue removal and fitting to the model. These are the type of things that can easily get snagged and when they snag they break, which can add to some complications. On the model here, I didn't have any problems with that. I was fortunate in that regard, but this is something that you may want to pay attention to if you're working on one of these builds. The pieces are painted in the following format where the middle section, of course, would be a steel cable. However, the end connectors are a different color as they are olive drab found on many real examples of these tow cables. You do have a few different ways to paint them. You can paint them olive drab or you can possibly just blend them in with the camouflage. I personally like painting them with the olive drab because it just gives the model just that much more extra color pop as opposed to just having everything oversprayed with the base coat. And this is something that's also seen on the unit on the opposite side and as you can see it does give a little bit of extra color as I referenced before. From the Tow cable takes this to the heater exhaust manifold. Just like I often mention in these builds, I drilled out this section here with a pin vise and a very small Dremel bit. This definitely improves the look of this section overall. However, this is a somewhat risky procedure because the material found on the exhaust here is very thin and also it is angle cut. Because of this, drilling this section out can potentially cause problems, specifically if the individual does not have the right drill bit or a pin vise on hand, let alone the skill sets re required to properly drill this and drill it center. If the individual is drilling this and they go off center and possibly blow out of the side, this is something that can actually hurt the look of the build as opposed to helping it. So this is something that should definitely only be undertaken by someone that has a lot of experience with working with things this small and also with drilling out holes in this type of manner. Moving upward takes to the turret and you get to see the big doofy boxy turret now in its full glory, which is again probably my favorite part on this vehicle. So starting with the grenade launchers, as I touched on before, these sections here were drilled out and I went ahead and added the firing cables to both sides. With the model fully painted and weather, you get to see just how much more improved it looks by adding these small little refinements. Same is also true for the rear antenna bases. They're a bit janky right now just because I've been handling the model, but regardless, you can see how much better they look compared to the stock original ones, which were very under-detailed, in my opinion. With the new units in place, you get to see just how much more improved the model looks, and also, since I painted them with a color of olive drab, it sticks out over the Merc camo scheme that this model does have. The painting of the antenna base in different colors, another way, as I frequently mentioned, to give extra color pop to your build, gives it a little bit more personality, and it's something that would definitely not be uncommonly seen in the field. With the turret rotated to the side, you get to see the antenna wire coming out of the bottom portion of the antenna base and entering into the rear portion here of the vehicle. Again, it adds just a little bit of extra spice to this build. Carrying on upward takes to the 40mm Bofors sections. These are the kit originals and do a 
adequate job with the overall detailing at hand. These are the type of things that you want to add at the very tail end of the vehicle. It's probably the last thing I added to the model in order to finish it off. This is for two reasons. First, these are very snag prone. You can easily clip and break one during the course of painting and you know handling. But also, more importantly, they are not painted with the remainder of the vehicle. These sections here are just left in their El Natural black parkerized or phosphate type coloring and or that's specifically true on the real one so on the model one over here these are best painted and weathered off of the model and then added at the very tail end of the build this is the best way to protect them from any sort of overspray and also it's easier to paint them in that format as opposed to trying to paint around everything once the model is fully camouflaged the elevation system is one that's actually very very stiff on this model which is excellent the last thing you want on your anti-aircraft vehicle is the thing to just you know, plunk downward on you and looks all mopey in the press. And this was again just built out of the box. You can probably hear the little snap mechanism on the inside. Which is a nice positive detent type system and it really does help keep the barrels in the position that you last left them in. If the unit loosens up over time or if you were assembling the unit and things were not fully squared away, perhaps you may have a little bit of a droop issue. If that's the case, just a small little drop of white glue on the turning sections is more than enough to keep the unit pretty much stiffened up and ready for the model to be left in the position where you leave them. It's also at this time over here, you get to see the metal grab panels that I added earlier. And once added to the model and painted and weathered, it really makes it that much more polished compared to the molded and blades that the kit had originally. This is also true, of course, for the one on the side here that I referenced earlier. While on the topic of things I added at the very tail end of the build, this leads us to both the two radar systems. The unit is a multi-part assembly, as I touched upon before, so there is some seam work that needs to be contended with. Which is odd because on this model here, there's no seam work on the barrel sections, which is generally where you tend to see seam work on these tank model kits. But for this one here, it's one of the rare examples where that's just not the case. The seam work is found on this example right over here. And once the seam work is concluded, it just blends in with the, you know, remainder of the model's details. Just like with the 40 millimeter bofors, this gets added at the very tail end of the build as it's just easier to paint and weather everything with this unit off as opposed to with it being installed in place. You can still do it, trust me, I've done it before and it's going to be something I'm going to be mentioning again in another video, but it is much easier done when it's off the model. The radar itself is another piece that was painted off the build and then added at the very tail end of the build, basically completing it in the finished format. I'll go back to that momentarily. To the other radar that we have right over here, again, multi-part assembly, it's a two-piece type affair, so after these seams are polished down, it leads for a nice seamless effect that you can see presently on this model. What's interesting is that once everything is fully assembled, the top radar over here can spin freely, which of course on the real one would be able to spin really, really fast during operation. And also, one other thing I want to mention is that this can fully retract, or it can retract, just not fully retract, and you'll see in a moment. This is how the unit retracts on this model over here, and that's basically the most you're going to get it in its retractive state. I believe on the real one it can retract further, but for some reason with the way these older Tamiya kits are, or Academy kit in this case is, that's basically the best you're going to get with the piece in its retractive format. Which I gotta say works pretty well, and as a kid I used to play with it all the time on my other Sergeant York. On the topic of the actual radar covers themselves. You do have two options on how to paint them. I've seen examples where these are green and I've also seen examples where they are left in black. So for this one over here I went with the black format because I figured it would blend in better or I should say it would look better with the vehicle's desert merc camouflage scheme but again this is something that's really more or less up to the builder's discretion. So the black is just standard flat black and then I weathered them to give them the look that you see here. One thing that you do gotta pay attention to is that on the leading edge of the square one, you have these molded little notches. And you also have this little square section found right here on the conical radar. These are actually white on several examples. So 
with a very fine point paintbrush, I was able to paint these sections in the format that you see here, and it just gives that much more extra color pop to the vehicle overall. One other thing I want to mention at this time involves this little bit of equipment that we have right here. This is a pencil mount, and it's actually what's used to hold a MG of one flavor or another. For the Tamiya and Academy renditions, for some reason they did not have the MG fitted in place, and they have what is a, what appears to be a rubber dome fitted in this location. For this model over here, I just simply painted the dome with the Tamiya rubber black and just left it in that format. However, if you are working on one of these models, you could just, you know, sand that down with a needle file, drill it out, and add a GPMG of one flavor or another, either an FM mag, or what in my opinion would be more appropriate would be an M60 Delta. But regardless, neither of which are supplied with this model. As a side note, the M60D, I believe, is supplied with the TACOM kit, and that's something that's, again, a pretty interesting bit of equipment, and something that's going to be mentioned in more depth in, you know, a future video down the road. While on the top portion of the turret, I do want to briefly mention the two crew hatches. We have a hatch here for the commander and another hatch here on the rear portion. These hatches are non-functional. The rear hatch here is intended only to be mounted in the closed position, while the commander's hatch, you have an option of either mounting in the open or closed state. For this model here, obviously I went with the closed format. And that's all there is to mention about the model's detailing, which takes us to the camouflage and the weathering. For the model's paintwork, obviously I was going to go with a Merc camouflage pattern. For a Sergeant York, it just goes, right? It, it, some vehicles, they just basically have to have a Merc by law, and the Sergeant York is definitely one of them. And for this pattern, I went with the iconic Grey Desert camouflage Merc scheme, which is one that would be more than appropriate for this vehicle. For the Merc camouflage pattern, this was something that I've been playing around with on a number of other builds that you could see on the ECA channel, but this one here was applied in the same manner as I referenced on some of those other builds, where on this build, the entire camouflage is applied with a paintbrush. Now, this is very different compared to the way I generally build my models, as I often mention. Generally, I use an airbrush for the application of the camouflage patterns, be it on a World War II German tank, American tank, or, you know, anywhere else in between. But for a Merc camouflage pattern, I personally have seen that they look better in a paintbrush format. Now, when it comes to the Merc camouflage, you have lots of options available in terms of the different versions as they have a summer version, a winter, desert, you know, there's a tropics, there's a bunch of different patterns. They all look cool, by the way. However, the applications are also one that you have some artistic licensing with because the Merc camouflage pattern was applied in a number of different ways. I've seen renditions where the camouflage pattern was applied with a spray gun, but I've also seen versions where they've been applied with a paintbrush. It basically just depended on the vehicle and if whether or not they had the equipment on hand to use the spray gun or not. I've talked to several veterans uh, personally who've said, yeah, when they were, you know, ordered to paint the tanks, basically they just gave them a little paint by card number sheet and uh, some buckets of paint with a paintbrush and said have at it. So this is something that you do have several options with. In addition to the spray gun being used for the blotches, I've even seen the sh little schwas over here painted in both spray gun and paintbrush, and the two are not mutually exclusive. So you can have a Merc camouflage airbrushed on with the little leaflets things painted with a paintbrush and vice versa. So this opens up a lot of creative licensing for the builder, which is awesome. However, in the past I have done basically both renditions before where I've applied the camouflage pattern with the airbrush and I've also applied certain aspects of it with the paintbrush. In my opinion, after doing this as long as I have, I prefer the Merc camouflage being done with a paintbrush. These camouflage patterns just look so much crisper and so much more defined when they are applied in the paintbrush format as opposed to when they are sprayed on. So the entire camouflage pattern outside of the base coat was applied via the paintbrush. And by the way, paintbrushing is a skill set all in its own, and it's something that you really need to have some practice with. It may sound simple to do, but you do have to really make sure that the paints are at the appropriate thinness. This is absolutely paramount when you're doing a paintbrush job. You can just take the paint out of the bottle and apply it to the surface and you're going to have some problems. You're going to need a good brush or else you'll get things like thick strokes and other things 
things that are not necessarily something that is good to have. So this is definitely something that you need a lot of practice in. Fortunately, I've done this enough times that I've been basically been building my skill sets in paintbrush camo work. And the one that you see here is basically one of the latest builds that I've done with it. It's also at this time here, I would mention a certain website that would have a excellent resource for helping you out on your mer camouflage patterns. I've utilized this resource on a number of builds. In fact, I used it on this particular build and a few other builds that came after this one. And normally I would put the link right here in the comment section, or I should say right here in the in the lower half of the video, as well as also in the description. Unfortunately, I can't anymore because it literally seems like they disappeared within the last few weeks, which sucks because I literally just used them not that long ago when I before filming this video on another build and it came in really handy. And sadly, now that's no longer the case, which sucks because this website, not only did it have a good color chart on all the different Merc Verdants that they have, but they also had all of the US government, or I should say US military, templates for all the different vehicles. Things from the Gamma Goat, to the Abrams, to the uh, M68 2 Starship, to you know the M5, M1, you know, 551 Sheridan, you name it, they had a Merc Camel for every one of those, and they're gone. So that really does suck, specifically since I do have several other tanks in my stash that need Mercs, and Looks like I'm going to have to do some more, uh, you know, pavement pounding in order to find the same templates. Regardless, if I ever find them or find a good resource, I'll put that in the comment section or in the uh, next videos that, that are to be posted. Regardless, for this one here, I did use the template for the lower hull. For the turret, they did not have a Sergeant York turret template, so I had to basically wing it from pictures in the illustration on the instructions, the box art, as well as also some pictures online of the real Sergeant York in this configuration. Plus, I also have to basically, you know, use my head a little bit on some of the application on some of the areas that I was blind about. Regardless, in the end, I really love the paint job. It came out really, really good. I love how flat everything looks. And on that note, this leads me to the paint. After the base coat was applied via the airbrush, it was then time to apply the blotches. For the color that you see here, I went with a new paint that I stumbled into recently in my local hobby shop from Mission Models. Mission Models I've seen reference on a few other YouTubers out there that do models and their paints are very, very good. In fact, they basically kind of like filled the niche that Model Master left when they went ahead and ceased all operations. And many of those colors are now being offered by Mission, which is excellent. However, unlike Model Master, where they were enamels, and they did have some acrylics as well, but they're mostly known for their enamels, Mission Model paints are all acrylic based, and they are basically thin to the point where they're ready for application from the get-go. Be it an airbrush, or in this case, they were very similar, or I should say it was very close to consistency for a paintbrush. One of the paints that they had was the Merc camouflage scheme. Specifically for this build, the desert one, which is absolutely perfect. And I gotta say the color is awesome. Right out of the bottle, no other tints need to be mixed to it to get the color that you want. It is the perfect Merc camouflage color. And I am so glad I found it because I love the Merc scheme and it was always a pain to try to, you know, cobble something together and really try to, you know, emulate something. But having it as a bottle format, saves a lot of time. So the paint itself was nice and thin. However, I did thin it a little bit more just to make it as flat as possible. And once the, the paint was applied via the brush in the appropriate locations, I let it sit and let it dry. And then I just continue with the remainder of the paint work. For the black little leaflets, this was done with just to me a flat black. And as for the other tan leaflets that we have here, this is done with Tamiya Desert Sand. Again, all done via the paintbrush. As you can see, if I bring them all up close, everything is nice and crisp, and it just lends itself for a nice, sharp camouflage scheme overall. Did take a little bit longer to apply the camouflage compared to a airbrush. However, that time was definitely well spent, and it just leaves itself for some excellent end results. 
This was really the first model where I really used the Mission Models paint to a great extent. However, this is not the first time I actually used Mission Models paint. The first time I actually used their paint was on a 148 scale Aurora M46 pattern. I used their flat yellow paint and I used it to airbrush on the base work for the Tiger Face. If anyone has seen that video, I recommend checking it out because I go into more depth on the paint work on that. However, for this one here, it was a little bit more expansive as opposed to the other one where basically the paintwork was just in a small section. For this one here, the entire model was going to be receiving its camouflage, including the running gear. And one thing I quickly noticed about this paint is that once it dries, it, it applies excellent and it looks great once it dries. However, it does have one Achilles heel. That Achilles heel is that this paint is super, super super susceptible to moisture. I found this out the hard way where I was painting something and fortunately it didn't cause any damage but I had like a drop of water uh, drop off the paintbrush and land onto the surface of the paint and I instantly saw that the paint just washed away. It was almost like I was painting the thing with terracotta. So the paint is very 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 susceptible to moisture. Why this is very relevant is that this paint here needs to be varnished, okay? This is definitely top level modeler's paint and most modelers out there tend to use varnish on to seal everything for good reasons, excellent material. And this paint here is, you could tell it's made for that type of market. And why this is important and relevant is because generally on my builds, I don't varnish the model until the very tail end once the markings are applied and I have the tools on and basically the only thing needs to be applied next is the track. At that point, the model gets varnished. Once the varnish sets, I throw the tracks on and I continue with painting some of the gloss fittings. For this one here, you do have to layer out your varnishing. And why this is important is because where I add my weathering, this is done with washes and filters. And both of those, not to mention the double toning. And all of these techniques are done with water-soluble paints. Needless to say, with the brown over here being susceptible to water or moisture, this can lead to big problems. So I saw this coming, you know, when I realized, oh crap, this stuff is very water soluble. So what I did was after the camouflage pattern was thoroughly applied, I'm talking about the brown, the, the two leaflets and all that stuff was concluded. I loaded my airbrush up with VMS matte varnish and I applied a varnish coat to the entire model. A thin one, but a varnish coat nonetheless. Once the varnish coat was set to dry, it was then time to start adding the remainder of the weathering, as well as, more importantly, the markings. That's another thing that's really important to point out. The markings are water slide decals. And to apply water slide decals, you need to put a little water on the section over here in order to act as a lubricant so that the decal can slip into place. This is a bit hard to do if the thing is water soluble. So after the model was the, I should say after the paintwork was concluded, the model got varnished. After the varnish work, I applied the markings. Once the markings were finished, I then re-varnished the model a second time. And that leads for the end result that you see here. For the model's weathering work, this was done with both the airbrush and my dry brushing techniques, many of which I reference on many other videos. The airbrushing is used for the counter shading, the sun fading, and the dry brushing is used for the chipping effects that you see presently. The VMS matte varnish was instrumental at getting this model sealed off just so that I could keep the paint on the surface permanently and also to help with the decal adhesion and then finally for the decals to be sealed to the remainder of the model. One thing I love about the VMS matte varnish is that it dries very flat on the surface. It's first applied via the airbrush and it's applied in a nice even coat, but when it dries, it just has such a nice flat look to it. And by flat, I'm not necessarily referring to the sheen. It definitely does that in spades. As you can see, there's no reflection of any sort. But also what I mean is that when you apply it, 
it doesn't show on the surface at all once dry. It is as, like, it's not even there. It's amazing, this material. I reference it a lot in my other videos, but for this one here, it's double important because of the water-soluble nature found on the var or on the paint. Another thing that happened after the model's varnish, and it's kind of a happy accident, is that on some areas, the varnish caused some small little discoloration and pitting effects on the the mission models paint and by painting i'm not talking about like cratering or anything like that i'm talking about just like some discoloration spots found on the surface which you can see hopefully if i bring the camera up to or the model up to the camera you can see some of those like dark spots you see here and there it's very translucent in its color and i gotta say it is the most happy of happy accidents because it just makes the model look that much better compared to the way it looked before it was varnished. And the Mission Models paint combined with the VMS matte varnish, I, I am in love with it. It looks fantastic. I cannot recommend this enough. However, I have to stress, this is the type of stuff where you need both. If you're the type of modeler out there that does not varnish his work, and I know there's a lot of them. I used to be one of them. I used to, uh, Tester's dull coat. If that's you, you need to up your game and you know, get into varnishing one, it just makes the models look 10 times better, specifically the VMS stuff. But also, this paint here, it's almost impossible to apply to the surface and leave it there without the varnish coat sealing it. So keep this in mind. It's a bit long winded right now, but I cannot stress enough if you're going to ro roll with the Mission Models paint, which you should because it's awesome paint. I picked up a bunch more for other projects I have in the shop you need the varnish to go with it. So that's definitely something to keep in mind for those people out there who aren't really sure about, you know, paint work and finishing work on their builds. The markings that you see on this model here are the kit supplied water slide decals and the quality on them were actually pretty decent. They went on without any sort of complications. They didn't crack or brittle up during the soaking phase. The extraction was effortless and also they appeared and varnished to the model without any sort of other complications. The decal quality was basically on par with many other good quality decal sets that are out there. These decals here were basically similar to like the ones you see on Tamiya kits, which I've also had some very good results in the past. The kit does supply you with an ample amount of markings. You do have the important ones, which you only have one of. That would be these little markings that we have here with these little triangles, as well as a few other smaller markings found on the model. However, the kit does supply you with two options of stars. You have black stars and white stars, and this is intended for you to build the model in a multitude of different configurations, be it with a Merc camouflage scheme or in a single coat of all dark olive drab. And all of these can be modeled by the builder out of the box because of these kit supplied markings. I will also say in the past, I've had some hit and miss with Academy decals, but for this one here, that wasn't the case. The decals were actually really, really good. And as much as I don't want to add to the already long runtime of this video, for this particular model here, it's going to be worth it because as I showed and mentioned before, this model is motorized. And what's the point of going through all of that work and showing all of the steps without having the thing at least run once during the video in a completed state? So at the moment, the batteries are hooked up and this thing here is ready to be powered on. As we can recall, the switch is on the bottom of the model. And here we have a very simple little diagram showing the switch in which direction the model be turned on to go forward or in reverse. So, with a quick of the switch. My model actually has some pretty good speed to it. And with the model placed in reverse, it runs absolutely reliably in either direction. And if I didn't know any better, and I think if I mentioned this before, I think this is the first time anyone on YouTube has motorized or functionally converted one of these Tamiya or Academy Start to New York model kit. And this thing really wants to go. One last thing I want to mention involves the paintwork on the track. I forgot to mention this earlier, but this is something that I always mention in my videos for good reason. 
These single piece vinyl tracks, you do not want to paint them with rattle can spray paint or enamels as a rule of thumb. I have seen tracks in the past painted with these materials brittle up on the model either before the model's even completed or many years after the model is finished and placed on display. If the tracks brittle up and crack on you, it's going to add some complications to your life. I always found it best to paint the model's tracks with Tamiya acrylics, XF, one, which is flat black for the base coat, and then after that, the other paints are also acrylics. The rust paint that I touched upon before is my own mix, and it's made out of exterior latex. In my opinion, this is the best way to paint these single piece vinyl tracks to ensure that they last a lifetime without any sort of complications. I have many builds that I've painted in this type of format. They are exceeding a decade now in age, and the tracks are in the same good condition as they were the day I finished the last paint stroke on them. So that is always something to be aware of. And at the end of the day, this was nearly a perfect build. I have hearts coming out of me with the final end result. I always had a soft spot for the Sergeant York, and this one here just turned out basically as good as my imagination can possibly have allowed. In terms of not just with the final paint work and the weathering work, which came out stellar, but also with the way the model was converted and also how I added some extra details here or there. Yes, this kit does have some foibles to it. There's no doubt about it, but it still was a very pleasant building experience nonetheless. Which of course is now the perfect point to lead us into skill level and recommendations. For those people out there who are a beginner and are looking for a entry-level model, would something like this be a type of kit I, I would recommend? And the answer is, yeah, actually, believe it or not, it is. I actually have first-hand experience with being a beginner and working on one of these models, as I've touched upon, I believe, a number of times in this video. So I can definitively say that this kit here is something that a beginner can possibly tackle. The one thing that a beginner needs to definitely pay attention to, though, are some of the smaller, finer details that are present on this model. Fortunately, there are not a lot of them, but this is something that someone needs to pay attention to, namely things like the radar masks and other small little turret fittings are the type of things that the builder needs to you know, make sure they take their time with. However, if they go ahead and carefully go through the motions of assembly, this build here should be one that, honestly, a beginner can definitely tackle. Not so much with paint, you're on your own with that, but the actual construction of the plastic kit, yes, it is somewhat beginner friendly. Of course, needless to say, if a beginner can tackle one of these models, so could someone with an intermediate to an advanced range. This model at its core is built on the Tamiya M48A3, which is an excellent and a simple build, and it's one that really just builds very well, even with minimum building experience. So if you are someone that have the other skill sets that are more advanced, one of these models here are definitely going to be something that you can build. However, is this something that I would recommend to someone who is with an intermediate to advanced range? Ah, this is where the asterisk definitely comes into play, which we'll be following up momentarily. But as for, you know, taking a model and building it from start to finish, oh yeah, one of those type of people could easily tackle one of these builds, probably with their eyes blindfolded. While on the topic of an advanced range builder, because this model here is based on the Tamiya M48A3, there are lots of aftermarket accessories out there that can be added to this model to enhance it from the kit original offering. This would include things such as replacement row wheels, replacement sprockets, workable track links, cast resin parts, photo etch parts, as well as even HD or the standard 3D printed parts. You name it, there's about three or four different type of accessories out there for this parent vehicle that can be added to it. However, is the old school Sergeant York kit something that would be worth pumping those extra parts and investment into? Uh, this is something that's really best left up to discretion of the builder. And all of this now leads us to recommendations. And this is basically the most interesting aspect, in my opinion, of this particular kit. Because this kit here does a lot of things really well, but it also falls short in some other key areas. So first and foremost, if you are someone who is looking for a super scale and detail accurate rendition of the Sergeant York model, the type of person that wants the most high fidelity and detailing, and they want the thing to be as close as possible to the real one, this is most certainly absolutely not going to be the kit for you. This kit definitely does have several mistakes in it, as I've already touched upon in this video. 
Because of that, if you are that type of an individual, I cannot recommend enough getting the TACOM version of the Sergeant York. That model is made of completely brand new tooling. It is a modern super kit, and it is something that will definitely make for a far more accurate representation compared to the older tooling kit that we do have here. It is in that kit's direction to which I would definitely steer someone who is an advanced range builder, or possibly even an intermediate builder, who are looking for something that is challenging, very, very highly detailed, and is something that they will definitely enjoy. However, that's gonna be the topic for another build for another day, and yes, I do have the TACOM kit in my stash. Yes, I am going to be building it, and yes, that will be the subject matter of its own video down the road. But for the time being, let's get back to this old vintage kit that we have here. So, if you are, again, someone who's really looking for a next level kit, this is not going to be for you. But that does not mean that this kit is totally worthless. And it's because of this information here, which is why I personally find these kits to be really, really cool, still relevant, and also, it's because why you tune into this channel as opposed to getting your news on reviews from any other sort of mainstream news group or other type of modeling channel, which the consensus will basically be the dogma of this kit's old, get rid of it, get the new one, and it's better, blah, 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 blah. And all that, yes, that is somewhat true. It is better for the reason I just mentioned. But this kit here still has its place in the market, and I'll tell you exactly why. This is the type of kit that I cannot recommend enough for someone who doesn't quite have the skill sets yet to tackle the new modern super kit. The TACOM kit is an excellent kit in its own right. Absolutely. It's, it's made with all modern technology. It's got a working suspension. It's got workable track links. It's awesome. However, with these added details also come added difficulty. And if you're the type of person out there that doesn't really have a whole lot of skill sets, or frankly, you're the type of person that aren't looking for a complex build, you're just looking for something quick and enjoyable, the TACOM model's not really going to be your best bet. It is for that person there, I recommend the older tooling one. These models here are far easier to put together, they are far more forgiving to put together, and because of that, can be built with less stress and also can be built in much shorter period of time. They have a much lower difficulty level and if you're someone who doesn't have the skill sets or again are just a casual type individual, you know, you play this vehicle in the video game and you think it's fun but you're not really a hardcore modeler, then the old school kit here cannot be recommended enough. Another advantage that these older tooling kits have over their modern super kit counterparts is the cost. The cost on this one specifically, the Academy rendition, is about less than half the price of the TACOM counterpart. The Tamiya is also less than the TACOM, however, it is more compared to the Academy. Is this something that's worth it or not? Well, you know, I'll be discussing that in another video. But as for the Academy specific version, yes, this one here is far more affordable compared to the TACOM. This compared, or I should say this combined with the ease of assembly is definitely something to factor in for someone who's again, a casual or a beginner looking to acquire one of these types of vehicles for their own collection. Another advantage that this kit uniquely has over its modern super kit counterpart is the fact that this one here can be converted to be motorized. As we saw in this video, the model can easily be adapted for this role. And if you are the type of person that has the skill and the engineering know-how, you can also RC convert one of these, which is a very interesting feature that is just not going to be easily done on the modern super kit counterpart. Obviously, this is also true for the Tamiya one as well. And it's probably one of the last niche advantages that these two kits do have in comparison to the other kit that I just mentioned. On a similar note, one of these older kits do have some playability to it, which again is something that I personally loved about the kit when I first built one when I was about, you know, seven or eight years old. So if you're the type of person that is younger and you're looking to get a tank because you're actually going to play with it, the Tamiya kit or the Academy kit here specifically is definitely something that would fit 
and scratch that itch far better compared to the modern detailed super kit. So if that's something that you're looking for, you're looking for a model with some playability to it, which by the way, I do get a couple of requests out there from individuals who watch my channel, and this is something they actually look for in a model, then the Sergeant New York from Academy is definitely something I would recommend to you. Another person who I would not necessarily recommend this kit to would be anyone who's looking to acquire one of these models and to really revamp and modernize and trying to make it as accurate as possible. If you're the type of person out there that had the idea to chop up the rear deck and to make it more along the lines of the real one, this is something that maybe would be best not to undertake and just build it more or less out of the box. If you are looking for that type of scale accuracy, at that point there, it would probably just be best to upgrade and get the TACOM release. However, outside of all of that, when it comes down to recommendations, who would I be recommending this kit to outside of the people I just mentioned? Well, let's just say anyone who is an avid fan of the Patton series of vehicles, this kit here is not recommended enough. The Star to New York is a really cool version of the Patton family, albeit a black sheep or more like a red-headed step-cousin of the Patton family, but it's a Patton tank nonetheless, and ergo, it definitely deserves a space in your collection. Another person who I recommend this kit to would be anyone who, again, is into just Cold War armor or post-World War II armor. This vehicle, being from the 1970s and the 80s time frame, is definitely one that fits right into that collection absolutely perfectly. Also, because of this subject matter, I cannot recommend this kit enough for anyone who's an avid fan of self-propelled anti-aircraft type vehicles. If you're the type of person that has the M163 Vulcan, the Chaparral, the Gepard, the Schlicka, or even the LAV25 AD, this vehicle here would fit into that collection like a missing puzzle piece. Another person who I'd recommend this kit to would be anyone who's into building and collecting vintage plastic tank model kits. This kit here is a vintage kit, so it'll fit into that collection without anyone, you know, thinking twice. Along similar lines, if anyone is into building and collecting kits from Academy, it's an Academy model, so there you go, but also if you're into building and collecting Tamiya kits. Yes, admittedly, this is one of those situations of, Mom, I want Tamiya, we have Tamiya at home, and this is to Tamiya at home. Regardless, the point still stands. This model basically is nothing more than a rebranded Tamiya, and it will fit into your Tamiya collection without anyone noticing otherwise. But of course, the big brain thing to do is to get one of each. You get the Tamiya one and the Academy one, and now you have, you know, a cool little conversation piece on the two examples of the same vehicle. And if you also add the TACOM kit to the mix, now you can have an example of every one of the Sergeant York representations in 135th scale that have currently been made. The Academy, the Tamiya, and the TACOM. Which is definitely going to be true for this collection here, but that's, again, a topic for another day. The very last thing I do want to mention circles back to availability and cost. If you're watching one of these videos and you're saying to yourself, wow, that's a really cool vehicle, I really like that kit, and I want to add it to my collection, I want to build one, perhaps you may want to do so sooner than later, specifically at the time I post this video. You see, at the time I'm making this video, both versions of the Academy and Tamiya Sarge or kits are out of production and haven't been produced for a period of time. And it's also highly unlikely that either company will re-release this old kit here. Just with the way both companies have been tooling up new kits and also re-releasing the older tooling ones, neither of which have revisited the Sergeant York. And it's, again, my opinion, a bit unlikely that they will ever do so. Because of that, if you're looking to get one, you might want to snag one, again, sooner than later because as time goes on and more of these kits get built, the stash goes down, which means prices will go up. Eventually, these kits may enter into collectability prices, and if that happens, the prices are gonna be basically on par or not greater than the version from TACOM, which is kind of funny to say for this older kit here, but that is something that has happened in the past. If these kits are, you know, about 80 or or $100 a pop, in my opinion, that's definitely something that decreases from the value of this kit here. And if the kits are at that point there, eh, you might as well it's probably be more worth it to honestly get the TACOM kit as opposed to the older tooling one, unless you're looking for something to make RC, but that's another story. So again, cautionary tale, you're seeing this video and you like this kit and you want to snag one of these kits for under 20 bucks or under you know $40, this would probably be the best time to do so. And with that, that wraps up this model showcase video for this 135th scale 
M247 Sergeant York. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe to this channel where it's a great way to keep up to date on new posted content being 135th scale model showcase videos like this one over here or the other larger scale project update videos that frequently get posted to this channel. Another way to keep in loop new posted content is by liking us on Facebook. There I have more photographs of this particular build as well as the other smaller and larger scale builds that have been seen on this channel in the past. Furthermore, don't forget to swing by EastCoastArmory.com for more 1.6 and 1.16 scale builds and detail components. Thanks again. I'll be seeing you all again on the next one. Till then.